and ladies and gentlemen and uh, a huge uh, thanks for joining us on this uh, session um, there's an awful lot for us to, to get through here. Um, just an introduction. Thank you for the kind words. My name is Tom Koshka. I'm Head of Anatomy for the uh, University and also the Chief Examiner for the University. And I'm also a Consultant Orthopaedic Oncology Surgeon here at the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre. The slides that you're about to see, I think, are all things that you could reasonably see in the FRCS examination. And I'm going to try and take you through what I think are the really key points that you need to know. Now, this is a slide that you all know well. You've all seen this. These are the wiring diagrams, as I call them. And these are just to remind you about the nerve supply of the various muscles in the upper limb. So the suprascapular nerve supplies supraspinatus and infraspinatus from C5 and the auxiliary nerve supplies the deltoid and teres minor, which is not shown in the diagram. So they're the principal abductors of the shoulder. Elbow flexion and extension is produced by the musculocutaneous nerve, what I teach the students as the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation nerve that supplies the biceps, the brachialis and the coracobrachialis. As we all know, the radial nerve supplies the extensor compartment of the arm and the posterior interosseous nerve, the derivation of this, the forearm extensor compartments. In terms of wrist extension and flexion, well, that's supplied by all three of the major peripheral nerves, the radial nerve, the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. Just be aware and be able to describe what both the median and the ulnar nerve supply in the forearm, both on the radial and the ulnar side of the wrist. The radial nerve coming from C6 and C7, the median nerve supplying flexor carpi radialis, C7, and the ulnar nerve supplied by C8, supplying flexor carpi ulnaris on the ulnar side of the wrist. In terms of finger flexion and finger extension, that's the, of course, the intrinsic uh, muscles of the uh, fingers and hand, as well as the long flexors and extensors. And again, supplied by all three of those major nerves, the radial, the median and the ulnar nerves. And here we're talking about extensor digitorum communis on the dorsal surface of the forearm. On the radial side of the hand, the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus to the radial side of the hand and the ulnar nerve supplying the flexor digitorum profundus to the ulnar side of the hand. So just be aware and be able to describe those. In terms of finger abduction and finger adduction, these are the intrinsic muscles. We know the mnemonic, which is pad and dab. And know that the nerve supply is via the median nerve to the two radial lumbricals and the ulnar nerve to the two ulnar lumbricals and both the palmar and dorsal interossei. We'll revisit that as we go through the lecture this evening. So a simple question might be, what's the arrangement of the brachial plexus? Lots of different ways of remembering this. I remember it with Ron Taylor drinks cold beer. And this reminds us that it's the roots, C5 to T1, the trunks, the upper, middle and lower trunks, the divisions via the anterior and posterior divisions, the cords, the lateral, posterior and medial cords, and then those terminal branches. So whether you're in the uh, written exam or the viva exam uh, or any part of it, you just need to be thinking about where the lesion might be within the brachial plexus and try and think about how you would narrow it down to be more specific about, about where the problem is. So here's the uh, left-sided brachial plexus. We won't dwell on this in too much detail. This is the one that we all frantically look at, including me, the night before the exam or the night before the lecture, just to remind ourselves where all these various branches come off. And I think although you'd be expected to know the lumbosacral plexus for the lower limb, you certainly wouldn't be able to uh, or be expected to draw every single branch of it, but I think you would be expected to draw the brachial plexus. And there's several very good videos available on YouTube where people show their various techniques of drawing this. Just one top tip is that uh, many of you will have learned how to draw either the left or the right brachial plexus. Remember that the examiner will be looking for that. So if they ask you to draw the brachial plexus, a particularly mean thing to do, which can happen, is they'll see which side you go to draw, for example, the left, and then they'll ask you to draw the right because they know that you're more uncomfortable drawing that side. 
So just be able to draw both if you're going to be able to do it. And you can't rely on what one candidate did in the exam, which is to draw one side and then flip the piece of paper over to show the other. It's a nice trick, but I'm afraid not good enough. So here's the uh, brachial plexus. This is protected by the bony clavicle. So the clavicle lies anteriorly with the brachial plexus behind. And this forms an important bony protection as well as a structural support to the anterior shoulder. And just a reminder, I'm sure most of you will be aware of this, but if you're asked to identify the various parts of the brachial plexus, one of the very straightforward ways of doing so is to look for the letter M lying on the auxiliary artery. So you can see here that this makes a clear letter M and fortunately that's the median nerve in the center of that lying right at the front of the auxiliary artery. So if you get given this kind of photograph, just be able to talk about the roots as they emerge from the spinal canal, uh, the relationship of both the subclavian vein and subclavian artery, just know where those lie and know where the brachial plexus emerges, of course, between scalenus medius and scalenus anterior. Be able to describe Horner syndrome. So this young lad has a very characteristic appearance of a, a Horner syndrome. And of course, we remember the mnemonic, which is MAPE, which stands for meiosis, pupillary constriction, anhydrosis, a lack of sweating, ptosis with the dropped eyelid, you can see on his left eye, and enophthalmus, usually in more long-standing um, Horner's syndrome, where the eyeball is sunken into the orbit. And in fact, although this is a relatively rare condition, I did see this in my clinic just this week uh, with a patient who presented with a lung tumor uh, and caused that very textbook description uh, of a Horner's syndrome, which we've all read about. So just be able to describe that in some detail. Here's another clinical one. So what would be your differential diagnosis for this uh, young patient who comes along to your clinic? Well, that's autosomal fascioscapular humeral dystrophy. Uh, a bit of a, a mouthful, but those abnormal position of the uh, scapula is really a spot diagnosis. What about this patient? Uh, it's black and white photograph of the left shoulder, and the examiner wants to know if this is a supraclavicular or an infraclavicular injury uh, in the absence of a rotator cuff tear. Well, you can see that there's both supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscular wasting, and therefore this must be a suprascapular nerve palsy. We know that the suprascapular nerve supplies both the supra and infraspinatus, and therefore it must be a lesion of this nerve. So you want to really get to that answer very quickly for the examiner and explain what you're seeing. And this is really a key slide for the FRCS. This should probably have a red box around it because this piece of anatomy is something that comes up time and time again, both in the written questions and in the vivas and potentially even in the, the clinicals. So here's the nerve. This We're looking at a, a section through the scapula here. Here's that important ligament, the superior transverse scapular ligament, which lies across the top. And here's the artery that passes over the top, but the nerve passes underneath. And therefore, that's a potential site of nerve entrapment. If the nerve is trapped here, that's going to produce weakness of both supra and infraspinatus, as opposed to if the nerve is trapped further down at the spinoglenoid notch as the nerve passes more distally, and it will then we'll then see only a palsy of the infraspinatus. So again, just one to have a look at just before the exam, perhaps be able to draw this, certainly be able to recognize it so that you can identify where the lesion might lie. So remember, water over the bridge. What are the major terminations of each chord? Uh, you might want to just remember this slide. It does come up in the MCQ questions later. So in terms of the lateral chord, that's the musculocutaneous nerve. The posterior chord, is the radial and auxiliary nerve. The medial cord, the terminal branch of this is the ulnar nerve. And both the medial and lateral nerve will of course must be the median nerve.
Let's move on. Let's think about uh, AC and sternoclavicular joints and the clavicle. And again, another really key slide here. This should have another red box around it. We're looking at the right shoulder, the coracoid process and the important structures around that. Now, as you all know, there are nine structures which either originate from or attach to the coracoid process. But what you're absolutely not going to do in the exam is say that there are nine structures because the immediate next question of the examiner will be to ask you to list and name all of those nine. So the way that you're going to phrase it is this is an image of the right shoulder. We can see the coracoid process. There are several important attachments and origins from the coracoid process some of which are the following. And I would probably highlight the fact that pectoralis minor um, originates from the uh, coracoid process from the second, third and fourth ribs. Of course, the conjoint tendon, vitally important for us as orthopedic surgeons, which we'll revisit in the next few slides. And then the conoid and trapezoid parts of the coracoclavicular ligament and then the coracoacromial ligament. And again, vitally important. This is a really important structure to preserve shoulder stability, to prevent escape of the shoulder anterosuperiorly. And there's that really annoying artery. That's the one that we've all pranged when we're doing a shoulder arthroscopy. We inadvertently hit this and then that bleeds and we get a complete red out of the screen. That's the acromial branch of the thoracoacromial artery. To come back to our conjoint tendon, all of the important brachial plexus lies underneath this. And so there's a safe side and a very dangerous side. Unfortunately, I have to spend a fair bit of time over on this side of the conjoint tendon, but for most of our shoulder surgery, we'll try and stay over on the lateral side and sweep that structure medially, which will then protect our brachial plexus. So remember the superior restraint to the AC joint is that important coracoacromial ligament. So a question might be, which of the following steps is important when debriding a painful massive rotator cuff tear? Hopefully now we won't even need to read the answers. We're looking for that crucial structure, the coracoacromial ligament that we saw on the previous slide to make sure that that humeral head can't escape. Let's move on to the shoulder. Now, this is a, a slide that comes up in the textbooks, and I must admit, when I was learning this, I didn't quite understand what this was trying to show. But this diagram is showing a bird's eye view looking down onto the shoulder. So we can see the humeral head in the center of the screen. Here's the glenoid. We know that this must be the front because the coracoid always points to the front. We're looking right down along the length of the humerus, and we've drawn a line through the medial and lateral epicondyles, which gives us our retroversion of the humeral head. Now, the really nice thing that you're going to say in the exam, if you get this kind of case, before you take off the um, surgical head of the humerus, you're going to measure and look at the patient's natural retroversion so that whenever you put an implant in, you're going to make sure that it's exactly matched to the patient's uh, native position. Don't forget, of course, that the, the glenoid is orientated about five degrees posteriorly, that's retroverted, and those combined structures uh, mean that the uh, humeral head is reasonably well contained in what, of course, we know is the most unstable joint in the body. Looking down superiorly onto this gentleman's right-sided shoulder, here we can see <coughs> the rotator cuff from the top, the supraspinatus lying over here, the infraspinatus and the teres minor be able to describe the order of those structures and the subscapularis uh, tendon lying anteriorly. You'll note as well from the top of the shoulder here that this forms a triangle. Nature makes use of the fact that the triangle is the strongest structure. So the S-shaped clavicle lies anteriorly. Here's the spine of uh, the scapula and underneath this is the bulk of the supraspinatus. Now here's the slide that everyone uh, dreads getting in the exam, either in the written paper or in the viva. Uh, you could very well get given this slide and it's important to have a strategy so that you can confidently work out those muscles and structures around the inside of the shoulder. 
And I'll just give you my simple strategy for trying to work out uh, what these are. Now, obviously the glenoid lies in the center. That doesn't particularly help you, but there are two landmarks that I'm looking for to tell us which is the front and which is the back. So the first of these is the long header biceps. Remember the long header biceps comes in at the 12 o'clock position at the top of the glenoid labrum and the, and the long header biceps will be passing anteriorly. So the left hand side of the screen must be the anterior shoulder. This must be the posterior shoulder. The other feature that I'm looking for here is the coracoid process. So here's number six, the coracoid process. And you remember we said that the coracoid process always points towards the front of the shoulder. So that's our second confirmation that this must be the front of the shoulder joint. Here's the acromion, which lies superiorly. And therefore, by definition, number two must be the subacromial bursa. Well, now we've worked out which is the front and which is the back, it should be much more straightforward for us to label the relevant structures. And of course, the rotator cuff surrounds the proximal humerus. So here's the supraspinatus lying superiorly. Then we've got the subscapularis lying anteriorly. Then infraspinatus, the next one round, and teres minor. Once you've done those, it's then easy to undertake the next layer of labeling. Remember the deltoid muscle surrounds the majority of the shoulder. The deltoid muscle is unusual in that it has both an anterior, a middle and a posterior component. And then we can see the pectoralis major, teres major, latissimus dorsi and triceps. If you get the chance, it's just worth highlighting to the examiner at this point that the triceps lies opposite the insertion of the long header biceps. So the long header biceps inserts at the 12 o'clock position on the glenoid, the triceps long head originates from the six o'clock position. So tangentially opposite to each other. You should be able to uh, label the following insertions. So we're now slightly further down around the intertubecular groove. Of course, pectoralis major must be the lattermost structure. And the reason for this is that pectoralis major lies anteriorly and therefore the other two structures must lie deep to this and therefore it has to insert at the far lateral side so pectoralis major lying laterally latissimus dorsi lying in between the two and teres major lying more medially so just be able to identify those structures and of course we have the groove running in between the greater anessa tuberosities in which the long header biceps will lie what attaches to the lesser and the greater tuberosities of the humerus. So again, we've got this superior and uh, lateral view. So to the greater tuberosity is the three muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. To the lesser tuberosity, just one muscle, the subscapularis, supplied by the upper and lower subscapular nerves. A patient with a subscapularis rupture would have what clinical findings? Well, you expect them to have a positive Gerber's liftoff test, positive because they're unable to do it. Uh, they'd also have weak internal rotation uh, and they'd have increased passive external rotation. And you will get some of these in the exam, particularly in the uh, clinicals. And of course, the relevance to this is that, uh, particularly after an anterior approach to the shoulder, we really are fastidious about trying to repair the subscapularis so we don't leave the patient with this post-operative complication. Name the static and dynamic restraints of the shoulder. So be able to just divide this up very logically in your discussion. So the static is the articular anatomy, so the uh, relative shape of the bony glenoid, the glenoid labrum, which is made of type 2 fibrocartilage, and the structure of the labrum means that there's a negative intra-articular pressure. The humeral head is sucked in towards the glenoid, making it much more difficult for it to dislocate. It's surrounded by a thick protective capsule, and it also has important ligaments. The dynamic stabilizers are the rotator cuff, the biceps tendon, and of course, the pre-programmed scapulothoracic motion. So which of the following anatomical structures provides a dynamic contribution to shoulder stability? Well, we know the answer now, I've got a nice ordered structure for it. It must be the rotator cuff. Another red slide. So we're looking at the 
right shoulder and those really key spaces. Now, unfortunately, as many of you will be aware, because the uh, British and European textbooks differ from the way they describe this to the American textbooks, in the FRCS, whenever you get one of these spaces described, the writer or the examiner should define the space for you so that you know exactly what's being referred to. Let's just discuss these in detail. So the quadrangular space defined by the inferior border of Terry's minor and the superior border of Terry's major is seen here. And through that will pass the posterior circumflex humeral artery and the axillary nerve. They will wind around the neck of the humerus to progressively supply the deltoid muscle. Here's the triangular interval. That will carry the radial nerve and the profunda brachii artery. And over here, the triangular space, uh, which we don't see very often, but I see during my tumor surgery when we're taking out the scapula, that contains the circumflex scapular artery. So what you need to do is look at this slide just before the exam, look at the brachial plexus, look at this slide, and be able to draw out those boundaries for the examiner so that they know that you clearly understand not just what passes through them, but where they are. So on the PDF, when you get this, that will, will be sent out after the presentation. This is another of those slides I would really highlight just to go back and look over. So here's the quadrangular space in a bit more detail. The deltoid has been reflected away. So we're looking at the back of the shoulder here. The patient is in the sloppy lateral position with the deltoid reflected out of the way. Here's the axillary nerve emerging with the posterior circumflex humeral artery. And we can confidently say to the examiner, that that's passing through the quadrangular space. So a way of remembering it is that it's uh, four syllables or words, the uh, quadrangular space and passing through that is the posterior circumflex humeral artery and the axillary nerve. Just to uh, show you in a little bit more detail, here's the uh, axillary nerve and the artery passing through that uh, quadrangular space. Here's the very tight um, shoulder capsule seen posteriorly. So if we're doing a posterior approach to the shoulder, what we just need to try and do is to sweep those muscles away so that we can safely access the back of the shoulder. It's an absolute disaster for the patient if we inadvertently damage the axillary nerve and leave them with no deltoid function. Uh, it's really disabling for the patient to, to have that. Now returning to the front of the uh, shoulder, and just to remind you of the important blood supply uh, as this comes down. Remember, of course, that the uh, subclavian artery arbitrarily changed its name to the axillary artery and will then become the brachial artery. Uh, we'll look at that further in the next few slides. But really what this slide shows you is the important blood supply to the humeral head. And that's formed from both the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries, which you can see arising off here. And this important smaller branch, which has got the circle around it, this is the arcuate artery. And the arcuate artery provides the uh, important blood supply to the anterior aspect of the humeral head. So the three portions of the axillary artery are uh, the supreme thoracic, which goes from the first rib to the medial edge of pectoralis minor, the uh, thoracomial branch and lateral thoracic arteries, deep to pectoralis minor, and uh, distal to pectoralis minor, uh, the subscapular, anterior circumflex humeral, and posterior circumflex humeral. So the key takeaway from this slide is that it's the pectoralis minor that divides it into the first, second, and third portions. I think you're very unlucky if you get asked about the first and second uh, parts and their various branches. I think it's much more reasonable you will get asked about the terminal branches of the third part of the axillary artery. Here's just another view just to uh, show us that important relationship to pectoralis minor. As we said earlier on in the presentation, pectoralis minor usually arises from ribs two, three, and four, and this diagram also five. That passes to the coracoid process, but the artery passes underneath that. So if we need to get to that, uh, then we must be prepared to potentially do a coracoid osteotomy to affect pectoralis minor out of the way. And that will then give us clear access down uh, to the artery and perform our repair. This just shows what can happen with a proximal humeral fracture. Here's a, um, a neck fracture. And you can see that the distal fragment has moved medially here. And this is now tenting the brachial plexus. 
and uh, really this is just to remind us all of the hazards of being in this area uh, when we're reducing these fractures we must be really very careful about where we place our towel clips and I often find that just a gentle finger reduction and a finger sweep is the most appropriate and safest way of moving the brachial plex out of the way before gently reducing the fracture back into uh, position. Now moving a bit more distally, and this slide uh, is really important in terms of just reminding us about that important relationship to the conjoined tendon that we were looking at earlier. And if you remember, the conjoined tendon passes from the coracoid uh, process down into the arm. Here's the brachial plexus emerging underneath it. So when we've exposed this, we need to put our finger into this position here and sweep the brachial plexus medially so that we're away from damage. A few more important takeaway points here. So the main neurovascular structures are the uh, median and ulnar nerves, which, which are really very medially in the arm here before they pass across the elbow. Here's the radial nerve passing down through the spiral groove before it pierces the lateral intramuscular septum about 7.5 centimeters above the lateral epicondyle and before it becomes a more anterior structure as it passes down into the forearm. So what artery runs with the radial nerve? Well, we looked at that earlier when we were talking about the relevant spaces. That's the profunda brachii. What nerve runs in between the basilic vein and the brachial artery? That would be the median nerve. And which nerve is medial to the basilic vein? That will be the medial antibrachial cutaneous or the medial cutaneous uh, nerve of the forearm for the British and European textbooks. Now, this is a, a crucial um, cross section uh, and it sounds an obvious thing to say, but I have heard it in exams, you must make sure you decide whether you're looking at the upper or the lower limb. It's an absolute disaster in the FRCS if you start talking about this as being a cross section through the thigh, when actually we're looking at a cross section through the arm. It's very embarrassing when the examiner points that out to you. So. How are you going to identify that? Because of course they do look a little similar. There are a few key takeaways that help you identify it. The humerus is a relatively triangle shaped structure. So uh, the shaft of the humerus points forwards anteriorly. And then the real key giveaway is this radial nerve lying absolutely on the periosteum, the like of which you do not have in the thigh. Here on the medial side of the arm is the main neurovascular compartment. And it always amazes me what a very compact space this lies in. We all think of the median and the ulnar nerve as being actually quite well separated. But when you see this diagram, they're really very, very close together, just a centimeter apart and just separated by the neurovascular bundle. So in the right arm that we're looking down on from the top here, you can see that the danger area really lies between about eight o'clock and 10 o'clock, all of those key structures lying within that region. The muscular cutaneous nerve lies relatively anteriorly. That makes sense because as we said before, it's the BBC nerve, the British Broadcasting Corporation nerve, and that's gonna to have to supply the biceps, the brachialis and the cracobrachialis, which are all anterior structures. Here's that large posterior wad of the triceps supplied by the radial nerve. So another one, another slide just to draw a star on here, just on the night before the exam, just to make sure you revise the cross-sectional anatomy. So what does the auxiliary nerve supply? Well, the auxiliary nerve comes from the posterior cord and it will supply the teres minor and the deltoid shown in the green square at the top of the screen here. Nothing else more distally in the arm or the forearm. All of the action for the auxiliary nerve is very proximal. In terms of the innervation of the forearm, the superficial flexors, the deep flexors, and the superficial extensors, deep extensors, are supplied, as we said at the start of the presentation, by the median nerve, except half of flexor carpi ulnaris, the deep flexors supplied by the median nerve, except the ulnar half of flexor digitorum profundus, the superficial extensors supplied by the radial nerve and of course the more distal branch, the posterior interosseous nerve and the deep extensors supplied by the posterior interosseous nerve. What does the radial nerve supply? Well, we remember the wiring diagram. Now remember the radial nerve is more unusual compared to the median and the ulnar nerve because it does supply structures uh, within the arm. So here we supply 
the uh, triceps, both the long, lateral and medial head. It then goes on to supply the mobile rod and around the brachial, brachioradialis, ECRL and ECRB. And then it gives off the posterior interosseous nerve, which supplies the remaining uh, hand and finger extensors. And if you're going for the gold star, just remember that the last, the terminal branch of this usually, not always, but usually supplies extensor indices, which you can see going across, across the index finger. This is a really key MCQ question, uh, which will come up both in the uh, written paper and also in the virus and the clinicals. Just that really important relationship. You don't even need to read the question in detail here. You know what they're looking for. They're looking for that important relationship of about 15 centimeters posteriorly and 7.5 centimeters laterally. The closest answer we've got here is number two. That's our answer. So what does the median nerve supply? Here's the wiring diagram. Remember to tell the examiner that the median nerve supplies nothing in the arm. All of the action for the median nerve is below the level of the elbow. So this will supply the cut from the common flexor origin down into the uh, forearm compartment and finally into the thena compartment of the hand. This is the loaf muscles, the lateral two lumbricals, the opponent's pollicis, the abductor pollicis brevis and the flexor pollicis brevis down here at the very distal part of the supply. Don't forget pronator quadratus in the distal forearm in between the radius and the ulna. The ulnar nerve, similar in that sense to the median nerve, again, no supply up here in the arm. All of the action occurs below the uh, elbow. And the examiner would expect you to be able to surface mark the path of the ulnar nerve as it passes from the axilla down in the medial arm, behind the medial epicondyle, passes through flexor carpi ulnaris, and then down onto the ulnar sides of the hand to go in this widespread arch and supply the intrinsic muscles of the forearm and the hand. Just a, a question just to be aware of, the four joints that can produce a septic arthritis from direct metaphyseal extension, they are the proximal femur, the distal fibula, the proximal humerus and the radial head. So you'll notice uh, therefore that two of those important sites lie within the upper limb. So this could come up in the upper limb uh, adult pathology section. Where does the anterior humeral line cross on a lateral uh, radiograph of the child's elbow? Uh, Nice straightforward one. This will be through the middle third of the capitellum. Just be able to identify that on a radiograph. And the ligamentous stabilizers of the elbow. These are really very important in terms of keeping the elbow correctly in position. The radial collateral ligament on the outermost uh, side uh, of the elbow. Uh, and the annular ligament holding the uh, radial head into position. Of course, this is the site where we see a pulled elbow where the radial head uh, dislocates through the annular ligament. And then on the ulnar side, the ulnar uh, collateral ligament, as well as the capsule tightly binding the elbow into joint. Just be able to describe those uh, important attachments. And it is always surprising when um, people get muddled up with this at uh, FRCS level. You must know where the biceps attaches into. Of course, it's the radial tuberosity that allows a supination of the forearm by the biceps and that the brachialis uh, arises or inserts, sorry, into the coronoid process, just distal to the uh, capsule of the elbow in the proximal ulna be able to describe the common flex origin, the common extensor origin, uh, and be aware of where this thick inter intramuscular septum arises between the two bones. And of course, the, the vessel and the artery pass through here and then lie on top of that intermuscular septum. For tennis elbow, uh, the structure we're thinking about is extensor carpi radialis brevis. That's the one that we're going to be looking to release when we do our nurtial N-I-R-S-C-H-L release. We're going to do the nurtial release to release that tendon here and release the uh, tennis elbow. So here's our next uh, important uh, cross-sectional anatomy. I think you'd be a little more unlucky if you um, got this in the exam, but certainly be able to orientate yourself. And the key structure to be looking for here is, of course, the ulnar nerve as it passes behind the medial epicondyle. 
be aware of those uh, anterior structures that uh, the uh, neurovascular bundle now lying relatively anterior uh, in the forearm with the brachial artery and the uh, brachial vein, several superficial nerves lying more peripherally. Now everyone gets uh, a little bit worried about uh, where the basilic vein and the cephalic vein uh, lie. So just a, a really easy way of remembering is that it's as simple as ABC. So the abdomen lies over here. Here's the abdomen. The basilic vein uh, lies more medially. So this must be the medial aspect of the uh, forearm and the cephalic vein lies more laterally. So we see that over on the radial side of the forearm. Just be able to identify uh, those superficial sensory nerves. We don't have time to dwell on those now, but they do tend to come up in the written exam and the, uh, the question will ask the relationship to these various uh, uh, veins as they pass through. So the radial nerve enters the forearm between which two muscles? That's between brachialis and brachioradialis on the lateral side of the arm. The median nerve splits pronator teres and lies between which muscles? Well, that will be between FDS and FDP. And the ulnar nerve lies between which muscles? Well, that will be between FCU and FDP. So just a, a simple way of remembering it. Uh, here's the uh, diagram. So the ulnar nerve lying in between FCU and FDP on the ulnar side of the forearm and the median nerve supplying between FDS and FDP on the radial side. Cross-sectional anatomy, exactly the same uh, comments that we made uh, uh, earlier when we were talking about the upper and lower limb. Please don't say this is a leg uh, when you look at it. This is uh, a forearm. And the way to identify that, again, it's a, it's a relatively easy mistake to make. But in the forearm, uh, it's really this huge bulk of anterior musculature, which is different in the leg. The, the posterior structure of the leg are much bigger. And these are two opposing triangles facing each other, separated by that intermuscular septum, with the neurovascular bundle lying on top of that and the median nerve lying relatively centrally. Here's the posterior interosseous nerve lying in the dorsal extensor compartment. So just be able to look back and uh, label some of those structures. So in terms of your forearm approaches, uh, the examiner would expect you to be able to safely get into uh, the forearm, so to get yourself in and get yourself out. Uh, obviously, of course, everyone knows the approach to the ulnar side. This is a relatively superficial uh, approach and will pass in a truly internervous plane between the posterior interosseous nerve supplying ECU and the ulnar nerve supplying flexor carpi ulnaris. But of course, on the radial side of the forearm, this is more difficult. And depending on the fracture pattern, that's the one that we all get worried about. I still worry about approaching the radius uh, through the forearm. There's an awful lot of structures which are, are really at risk. And what the examiner will be looking for when you're describing these approaches is to really show a very safe and common sense approach. So what you'll be saying here is that you'll make the superficial incision and then you'll largely use finger dissection to try and work your way safely down to the radius, moving these neurovascular structures out of the way to really try and keep them as safe as possible. Cross-sectional anatomy through the wrist, again, really, really uh, important. I just picked a slightly unusual uh, view of the wrist here. We're all used to that very uh, standard view of the carpal tunnel, but this is a slightly different section, but you could very reasonably uh, get this. And just again, be able to work out uh, the various structures. And really the key I'm looking for here is this muscular structure here. This is pronator quadratus running between the radius and the ulna. And then you can work out the other structures on top of that. Look for that median nerve. It must be the largest nerve that you can see in this cross section. So it should be really easy to identify. And then you can piece together the ulna nerve and the uh, branches of the posterior interosseous nerve, which by this stage will be really very small on the posterior compartment. So here's the uh, median nerve is going down just to remind us as it goes down to supply uh, the muscles of the thena eminence uh, and uh, there we go so dead on time Ruth I think I'm going to uh, hand over to you at this point we're going to do a quick poll here just to check everyone's been listening and then we're going to move on to some really exciting uh, uh, stuff I hope which will be some of the cases that we've seen uh, as challenges from my own unit so Ruth over to you with the quiz. OK, I'm going to start the poll now. Can you see that, Tom? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So we'll read it through. So in addition to the deltoid, what other muscle 
does the axillary nerve supply so hopefully nice and straightforward for you it's the one that always gets forgotten we don't see this uh, lesion very often in clinical practice have a go at that one number two uh, the terminal branch of the musculocutaneous nerve if you just scroll down Ruth if you can yep um, so terminal branch we've got a few different options there so the motor nerve supply of the lateral two lumbricals lateral two lumbricals hopefully straightforward that's great so that's good well nearly everyone uh, got the, the the first one right that's great yep so terry's minor remember if you have a, a nerve palsy of the auxiliary nerve uh, not only would we expect to see um weakness of the deltoid but we also see a positive horn blower sign uh, because the patient won't be able to suspend their arm in the abduction and external rotation so the arm will fall forwards uh, terminal branch the musculocutaneous nerve perhaps a little less uh, certain on this one but yep that's the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm just one to revise you, you you sort of need to know that and the motor nerve supply of the lateral two lumbricals well remember uh, that comes down to the uh, loaf muscles so that's the lateral two lumbricals the opponent's policies the abductor policies brevis and the flexor policies brevis so uh, that's those of course you know the question that everyone asks is well you know why why do we need to uh, know the relevant anatomy um, so here's the kind of case that we might expect to see this is the the case of the the vanishing humerus so here's a a, a right proximal humerus you can see the humeral hair but you can see there's a big lytic lesion which has destroyed the uh, proximal humerus and that's exactly the kind of case that we'd expect to see here on the the tumor unit so this is a really brilliant one to be able to talk about with the examiner to think through what you're going to say and really have a, a strategy about how you're going to work the patient up and how you're going to investigate them. Now hopefully we'll, we'll be able to revisit this when we um, do a, another session on bone and soft tissue tumours. So I'm going to try and stick a bit more to the, uh, the relevant anatomy today. But really preoperative design and, and preparation is the key. So we're, we're using our engineers to, to think very carefully about the type of implant that we're going to put in. But we're also very much thinking about the surgical approach. So the structures that are going to be at risk here. So we're thinking about the fact we'll have to do a, an extended delta pectoral approach. That we'll have to move the conjoint tendon out of the way with the brachial plexus. We'll be thinking about the fact that the auxiliary nerve is winding around uh, the humeral neck here. So very much at risk. But as I'll show in the next few slides, we'll be really thinking about what we can preserve, about what soft tissue structures we can preserve to try and retain function in this. But it doesn't have to be about metal. It doesn't have to just be about hardware. This is a young patient, a 25-year-old, uh, who presented with this aggressive chondrosarcoma uh, of the mid-shaft of the right humerus. You can see it's really very aggressive uh, least, and that's going to require a very extensive resection and this is one that even I now after several years experience would really worry about uh, uh, in the night and on the morning of surgery because there's an awful lot of clockwork that lies very very close to this tumour. Now we've got the medial sided neurovascular structures that'll be the median and the ulnar nerve over here which I'll really be worrying about and of course the radial nerve the radial nerve will be passing right next to that tumor and um, we'll obviously counsel the patient here that in all likelihood unfortunately the radial nerve may have to be resected during this now in the in the past we'd have typically resected this and put in a large piece of metal as an endoprosthetic replacement but what we'll try and do for this patient is to place the free fibula graft so we've borrowed a, a fibula we've wedged that into the humeral head we've left all of the soft tissue attachments around the proximal humerus just put in a little plate just to support this whilst this unites and then fix more distally and that will gradually hypertrophy up uh, and within a few years that will hopefully be just as good as the patient's native humerus now let's think about um, some of our intraoperative technique and the relevant anatomy so here where we're going into the 
uh, proximal humerus, then we're going to do an extended delta pectoral approach. We'll take the cephalic vein either medially or laterally, depending on which way it wants to go, uh, and then we'll come down onto the proximal humerus itself. Now, what we do here, rather like a mitral or an aortic valve replacement, is we'll place a whole series of sutures in the supraspinatus, the subscapularis, the infraspinatus, so we can reflect all of those muscles out of the way. We'll also need to divide the long head of biceps, which we'll try and repair into the rotator interval as well. So I like to think of the, the surgery around the proximal humerus as really being very much a soft tissue procedure rather than a bony procedure. The bony procedure uh, is really the easy bit. It's the soft tissue reconstruction that takes the real um, skill. And here's the tumor uh, resected. So really quite a large uh, tumor here. Here's the humeral head this is where it's expanded out of the bone it is covered uh, by uh, muscle here but we need to take this with a significant uh, margin and here's normal humerus down here we might use uh, constructions like this the the mutage uh, tube to uh, allow reattachment of the soft tissues but actually now when i'm doing these reconstructions i try and avoid uh, implantation of a mesh and we just try and reconstruct the native anatomy so this is uh, the approach here. Here's the proximal humerus uh, going into position. In this case, because of the extent of the resection, we did uh, place uh, a mutage tube. But the problem with this is it can get infected. It's very difficult to remove uh, once it's got a problem. And it can also become fibrosed and lead to quite a stiff shoulder. So where possible now, I try and uh, avoid that. Here's a, a, a fairly long endoprosthetic replacement, but it's really nicely in position post-operatively. It's uh, anatomically aligned. And what you're going to say to the examiner, remember the key thing you're going to say to the examiner before you do this is that you're going to measure the patient's native retroversion and you're going to try and match that when you put the endoprosthetic replacement into position. You're then going to try and reconstruct all of these muscles around that uh, proximal humerus to restore the natural anatomy and to try and give the patient as good a function as you absolutely possibly can. Even with careful surgical technique, we still do get these problems. Look at this. This is just between January 2013 and April 2013. The humeral head has subluxed, and I'm sure you've guessed what has happened here. What's happened here is that where we've tried to repair the rotator cuff, the metal has found a way to get in between those soft tissue structures. The rotator cuff has gone either side, and it's subluxed superiorly. So have an answer in terms of the examiner asking you about rehabilitation when you've done the reconstruction allow that reconstruction to bed in for the big reconstructions no active shoulder movement for about six weeks to let things really settle down and then passive assisted uh, from about uh, six to ten weeks gentle pendulums for ten weeks and then gentle active uh, motion avoiding uh, positions of instability just beware the uh, the rapidly growing tumor the ones that we um, really sort of tend to think about are the uh, renal cell carcinomas uh, the thyroids and the myelomas uh, i got caught out only the other week uh, with a renal cell carcinoma uh, we were under pressure to get the patient done i decided uh, uh, not to uh, embolize the uh, the tumour and uh, we did have you know, significant blood loss and it, it really can be quite a hair raising experience. Um, I wonder if any of you by now have noted the uh, deliberate mistake in the uh, angiogram on the left hand side. You'll see that the uh, the registrar who put the humeral nail in, in the first place unfortunately missed the, uh, the distal locking bolt. I'm sure we've all been there. Uh, this is a really interesting case. This is a, a, a young patient, a 37 uh, year old um, who presents with uh, this is the CT PET scan you can see there's increased activity around the the mid shaft of the uh, humerus on the left hand side the good news for him is no other aggressive disease elsewhere so we need to think of a surgical strategy to um, try and resect this and again in the past the treatment for this would be to resect the uh, proximal humerus to do a long uh, proximal humeral replacement uh, but now we need to think about better options, about better reconstruction. So in this, uh, we used a, a technique called the osteo bridge. Um, here's a, a sort of um, direct lateral uh, approach here. 
um, obviously the structure at risk is the, the radial nerve. So we've taken the, the radial nerve and moved that out of the way. Uh, that gives us uh, this gap, this intercalary resection. And the, and the really top trick, if, you, if you're going to talk to the examiner about this, the really key thing to mention here is that you must make a mark uh, to mark your alignment between the proximal and distal parts before you take the section out. Uh, otherwise, you have this disastrous situation where you take it out and then you've got the two parts flailing in between. You don't know the correct orientation. So use your diathermy or a pen uh, to make a mark there. Then you make up the um, the, the osteo bridge. So this is the uh, tumor which has been re resected. Several of the companies make these implants. This then uh, gets bolted together. So you have a, a variety of uh, sizes uh, and then that gets um, placed into the um, into the implant to, to reconstruct the, the gap. So um, guys, it's uh, it's uh, five to nine. I think uh, I'll, I'll stop talking and hand over to the uh, the moderators, but I hope that just sort of reminds you of the importance of the uh, anatomy of the upper limb. I think the anatomy of the upper limb is uh, perhaps even more difficult than that of the lower limb. And in terms of operating, uh, what makes it particularly uh, difficult, uh, but of course interesting, is that because the upper limb is smaller than the lower limb, all of those important structures lie very, very close together. So you've really got to understand uh, the anatomy to be able to safely uh, get in and out and avoid complications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Koska. That was very uh, interesting, comprehensive and very enlightening. Um, Thank we you. certainly learned a lot from it. This is a very difficult subject and you managed, you managed to break it down into an easy small steps. So that's, that is a real art. Um, Thank you. Um, may I present some, uh, my invite, I will first invite uh, Shuan to help me with this. I have some questions posted by the uh, audience, if you don't mind. We'll try and make them as brief as possible. So the first question was about the safe zones for children's KOR into the proximal humerus. Uh, would you recommend certain areas to avoid uh, passing the wires through for children if you are planning to do K wires? Yeah, well, it's a it's a very good point. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not a pediatric uh, orthopedic trauma surgeon, but if, if we just think about the uh, the relevant blood supply uh, of the 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 proximal humerus, let's see if we can uh, find that. Uh, perhaps if we go back here, so. Yeah, really, this is the, the sort of slide that you need to be, be thinking about. And um, what you're trying to avoid here is damage to the um, both the anterior circumflex humeral vessel and the arcuate artery. So really positions um, in, in and around the greater tuberosity, reasonably safe. Uh, distal to the uh, axillary nerve and the anterior circumflex humeral artery, also uh, reasonably safe if you're going to use a uh, a TENS nail, but try and avoid this uh, danger area here. You don't want to give the child avascular necrosis of the humeral head. Absolutely. Um, then the next question, you, you've positioned, you uh, put a picture of a fibula graft. Um, the question was, was it an allograft or an autograft? Oh, oh, always, always um, in our unit from the same patient. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we, I've got one next week, actually. We've got uh, a, a young patient who's got a very aggressive tumorous of the, of the radius. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really difficult case. I'm, I'm hoping, Ruth, actually, if you, if you invite me back to do the tumor session, I'd really love to, to show the uh, delegates this tumor. It's, it's very, very difficult. We've got to get into the forearm, get this tumor out, and then we'll use the, uh, the fibula. It, it's an amazing bone, the, the, the fibula. When, when we all walked on all fours, we needed our, our fibula to stabilize uh, our legs and to allow push off. But now that we're up on two feet, remarkably, we just don't need it. And when you see these patients back in clinic, about six to 12 months later, having had the whole of their fibula removed, it is really incredible that actually they don't even have any abnormality of gait. It's, uh, it, it's really amazing. Beautiful. The next question is about Henry's approach to the forearm. Um, is it safe or would you recommend to detach the pronated teres during that to try and uh, have a better approach to the bone? Yeah, so uh, let's just, where are we here? So um, 
I must admit, I don't detach anything. Um, I am a great believer in uh, in gentle finger dissection. So obviously you've got to use a blade. I use a large blade to go through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and then through the fascia. And then really I try and just use a finger to gently work my way down, to try and get my way down uh, onto the radius and just gradually move those structures sequentially out of the way. And one of the things I've learned over the years from my more experienced colleagues is that when, when you're when you're a more junior surgeon, you get you get very worried about seeing the nerves. You know, you get very worried about seeing the sciatic nerve, about seeing the median nerve, and you tend to think about your approaches so that you you don't end up seeing those in tumor surgery it's the opposite we look for those nerves we want to see them we want to see the full length of those nerves so that we can safely move them out of the way and that see that's really changed my surgical practice i now go looking for that median nerve i want to see it i want to feel safe as i go to sleep at night that i've moved it out of the way uh, i want to see the length of it i don't worry about making a long extensile approach and then i just gently move it out of the way i use a blunt retractor and then i can do my my bony work so don't be worried about looking for nerves if you see a nerve and you're gentle with it that can be just as safe as not trying to see it absolutely um next is um there is a question that came in part one uh, which was posted by uh the, the yes abdurrahman he says what structures might be injured by a clavicle plate screw protruding lateral to the underlying artery? Uh, let's have a look. So if we go back, uh, where should we go? If we go to probably about slide 10, that was a good guess. Uh, so, let's, so let's just take the question again. So we, we should be able to use this so as a guide. If you have a protruding uh, screw lateral to the artery, which structures yep. you would be worried about? Yeah, very good, very good question. So you really see it from the uh, the slide here. This is the uh, lateral cord of the brachial plexus, or potentially even the uh, muscular cutaneous uh, nerve, with this uh, sort of area here. So yeah, you you do need to be very careful about that. I mean, fortunately, mm -hmm. arterial perforation is relatively rare. It's the one that we all uh, worry about, and just to sort of answer your question in a slightly different way one of the questions the examiner might ask you uh, was that if you were on your own and you were doing an open reduction internal fixation of a clavicle and you accidentally put your drill into the artery or the vein what would you do and you need to you need to be really clear about um, how you will deal with that because that is a real emergency um, and obviously what you do is put the call out for the vascular surgeon you need expert help quickly i would get a colleague in as well so don't deal with this on your own there if there's a, a another orthopedic consultant in another theater uh, you want to get them in to get some help quickly but surgically you need to be prepared to perform an emergency clavicle osteotomy so that means either taking the plate off uh, where you've already fixed the plate or quickly cutting through the clavicle to be able to reflect the clavicle out of the way then you can apply direct pressure uh, to the artery until the vascular surgeon uh, arrives the auxiliary artery uh, the subclavian artery is one of those arteries that, that doesn't just bleed it makes a noise as it bleeds because the blood flow is so immense um, obviously as we all know it's more catastrophic to put the drill into the vein rather than the artery the artery you can usually get away with it it will perforate uh, and then close behind it as has happened to me the vein is much more dangerous the vein will tend to tear you must not try to repair that yourself that is for an experienced uh, vascular possibly even cardiothoracic surgeon excellent the next question was about the relative uh, um, ease of use between Henry's and Thompson's approaches for the forearm. Which one would you prefer? Oh, Which and you how prefer? would you decide to um, go between the two? Now, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, th I think that's a, that's a very difficult question. It's a good question. It's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I think I think what the question implies is, you know, is one or the other safer, or are you, uh, you know, particularly worried about uh, doing either of them? I think the more you do, you you just you actually stop worrying about doing those kind of, of approaches so I, I would just really very much look at the fracture 
uh, or the tumor configuration. I would think about how I was going to try and reduce my fracture. And then I, I would honestly just choose the, the, the most appropriate way in. And, and, mm -hmm. and often actually, you know, practically speaking, the, the, the funny thing is when, when you are approaching uh, the, the, the forearm, we, we don't necessarily worry about the named muscles. We just worry about getting safely in and safely out. Mm. Excellent. Now, I've got many other questions waiting. I'm afraid I had to um, skip through some of them, just leaving the more important ones because of time. Uh, two more left. Um, one is about the um, main blood supply to the radio, sorry, to the humeral head, because uh, there was some change in recent, uh, um, you know, understanding of how the blood supply comes. So is yeah. it more important anteriorly or posteriorly? Uh, well, so th th that, that's a very good question. And uh, I'm reluctant to give you a definitive answer because the problem is that some of the cadaveric studies have showed uh, that it was initially the posterior circumflex humeral artery and some the anterior. I think if you got that question, um, I would actually tackle it by just explaining in detail what the blood supply is. The, the reality of it is that we see avascular necrosis of the humeral head relatively rarely. We, we honestly don't see that very commonly. Whatever approach um, we use, we try and preserve those, those vessels. So I, I would just have that sort of debate with the examiner and try and quote a couple of the key mm. papers. Absolutely. I, I don't think that would be a pass-fail uh, remark. No, absolutely not. No, that'd be a seven or an eight, definitely. Exactly, exactly. And last question is, uh, when you mentioned about patient's retroversion, when you are looking for a replacement, how would you determine that? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So so um, I, I would literally, uh, let's see if we can get that bird's eye uh, view. So looking down at the top of the humerus so coming down here we go so i i would literally stand over the top of the patient now in my theater i know uh, and it'll be different for all of us but i know that the humor the center of the humeral head is always pointing to the clock in the center of the x-ray screen so i know that and then what i'm interested in looking down the top is where is the forearm pointing is it pointing to the scrub room is it pointing to the theater door where is it pointing and so when i do my resection and then i place my new implant into the top i'm simply going to match that anatomical position so that for the patient i get exactly the same retroversion for them so it's the bird's eye view from the top of the shoulder when you've got them in the beach chair position you're looking directly down onto the humeral head absolutely thank you very much i know that you have you have to be somewhere uh, no, so, no no uh, no my, no my, my my great pleasure and thank you very much for inviting me we are pleasure to have you here today and we will be certainly to discussing with you for f further lectures and take you on your uh, offer my great um, pleasure Ho yeah hopefully i get to meet you later in the year and we can take you through some uh, bone and soft tissue tumor oncology we're Thank already getting much. requests tom from participants <laughs> when it's gonna be so if we're we'll right. gonna you up soon <laughs> okay Excellent. thank you very Thank you much tom. guys bye for now thank you very much uh, mr Costco.